Unsolved. This video is part two and picks up where the last video left off and ends when John Ramsey finds his daughter's dead body in the wine cellar. On the morning of December 26, sometime shortly after 6 a.m. and after police officer Rick French and Carl Veach had arrived at the Ramsey residence, Fleet and Priscilla White arrived in his truck and parked in the front. Lynn Wood, do you have a recollection as to about what time you got to the Ramsey's house that morning? Fleet White, shortly, around 6 a.m. Lynn Wood, about how long after you arrived did you go to the basement the first time? Fleet White, I don't recall, shortly after. Lynn Wood, would you think it was within 10 or 15 minutes of your arrival that you went down to the basement? Does that sound right? Fleet White, yes, approximately. According to Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, talking about Fleet, after he left the train room, he turned right into the boiler room. At the back of the room, he said, he saw a door to what the Ramses called the wine cellar. He turned the closed wooden latch and opened the door. The room was pitch black, he said. He didn't enter, and he saw nothing. When he couldn't find a light switch, he closed the door and went back upstairs. Now, John Ramsey called Rod Westmoreland in Atlanta to arrange to get the money for the ransom, but Westmoreland wasn't there, so John left a message. Then he called Mike Archuleta, his pilot, and told him what had occurred and that if he could contact his older children who were flying from Atlanta to Minneapolis and have them fly to Denver and come to their house. John Andrew, Melinda, and Stuart Long boarded in Delta Airlines flight at 8.36 a.m. in Atlanta, headed for Minneapolis. According to this news story, I think I was paged or I was handed a note by one of the flight attendants saying that I needed to call home, recalled John Andrew Ramsey, who said he and his sister immediately changed course to Denver. I yelled and screamed and kicked to get on the airplane to Denver. I remember just thinking and processing it all. Okay, now to update you on who was at the Ramsey house. You had John, Fleet, and John Fernie. And then you had, in the sunroom, Patsy, Priscilla, and Barbara Fernie. And then Sergeant Paul Reichenbach arrived before 6.30 a.m. that morning. And then you had the police officers, the two of them. And at 7.13, Reverend Roland Hoverstock arrived. At some point, probably 45 minutes into this, I don't really know, half hour, 45 minutes into this, by this time, Barbara Fernie was there. It might have been Barbara Fernie and I. At this point in this statement, I'm just going to paraphrase what is being said. Around 7 a.m. that morning, they decided something needs to be done with Burke. So Fleet went up to his room with John Ramsey, and John Ramsey went into the bedroom and Fleet went back downstairs. And then a little bit later, Fleet went upstairs. Fleet White, 
And then we walk downstairs, and what I do? We walk down the front stairs into the entry, and I, and we just walked out the front door to my truck, which was parked in front of the house. And I thought what I would do is get Burke up here first, drop him off, get him squared away, and then go up to, rather than drive him all the way up to the Fernies and back, I just drop him off and then go get the Fernie children. So I did that. I brought him up and he got out of the car, walked up the stairs where, up to where I think my son was still asleep, or he was probably just kind of getting up, or he was awake. He saw Burke was there, which was great. So they went in and laid on our bed and plugged in a Nintendo game into our TV at the foot of our bed and started playing Nintendo. Detective Linda Art, what was Burke told about why he was coming over to your house? Fleet White, he didn't. He wasn't told anything, not a thing. I don't remember telling him anything. The only person who would have told him anything was me. And I, as far as I know, and I, I did leave the bedroom. It's possible that John told him something. But if he did, I have no knowledge of what it was. Other than John Ramsey, the only person who could have told him anything about the situation would have been me. Burke Ramsey was awakened by his father. Shortly after, Hoverstock arrived, and he was taken to the White residence as soon as he was dressed. I did not speak to him other than to walk him to Mr. White's vehicle. He seemed confused and was crying, and Mr. Ramsey again told me that he had slept through the night. The two victims advocates arrived sometime between when Burke left, before Burke left, or sometime shortly after he left. And around this time, Sergeant Rickenbach ordered the phone company to put a tap and trace on the Ramsey's phone number. And then sometime after eight o'clock, Detective Linda Arndt arrived along with Fred Patterson, her partner. Detective Arndt takes me to the back of the house and begins to brief me on what to do when the kidnapper calls. I sit slumped in a chair, listening. When he calls, it's important to buy as much time as we can, Arndt says. Keep him on the phone. I nod my head. Insist that you speak to John Bonet. This is the most critical thing. You must hear her voice. Yes, that makes sense. I keep nodding my head. In order to stall, tell this person that it's not easy to raise over $100,000. Say you will need until 5 p.m. Rod Westmoreland called John Ramsey that he had arranged for a credit line of $118,000 on John's Visa credit card. Shirley Brady, their former housekeeper nanny from Atlanta, called to talk about the holidays. Another person called and didn't speak and hung up the phone. Westmoreland called back to give a little more details about getting the money. At some point that morning, Patsy and John were asked who could have done such a thing. And Patsy suggested maybe Linda Hoffman because she asked to borrow $2,500 And John mentioned Jeff Merrick because he was fired from Axis Graphics and left 
in an angerly manner. And John Bonet's former nanny was mentioned also. John Fernie has been in contact with the president of a local bank, a personal friend of his, and is working to get the ransom money ready. John Fernie goes to the bank with my credit card to get the cash. The bank has already been instructed to copy each bill before giving it to him, but it's hard for them to come up with that many $100 bills. At some point that morning, the police show John Ramsey and his friends a copy of the ransom note. And John doesn't say much. And Fleet offers some ideas. And they talk about the $118,000. And in the next episode, I'll talk a little bit more about this ransom note. According to John Ramsey's book, Death of Innocence. Sometime that morning, I remember a day back in the summer when I had left my keys inside and was locked out of the house. To get in, I broke one of the panes in a basement window. Then I reached in, released the latch so I could climb inside. I think about the basement now. I jump up and hurry down there. That entry place needs to be looked at, I tell myself. I move down the basement hall and find the window. The pane is still broken, and the window is open with a large old Samsonite suitcase sitting right underneath it. Odd, I think. This doesn't look right. This suitcase is not normally kept here. Maybe this is how the intruder got in and out of our house. The window ledge is a few feet off the floor, so a person would need something to stand on in order to get up and out. At noontime, all the police personnel left for lunch, possibly to the Olive Garden, maybe. And Detective Arndt was left alone with John and Patsy and their friends. About 1 p.m., Detective Arndt suggested that John look through the house for anything out of place or suspicious. John, Fleet, and John Fernie looked around. John Ramsey and Fleet noticed the broken window, the suitcase beneath it, and some fragments of glass in the train room in the basement. At this point, I believe one of the men opened the window, moved the suitcase, and placed a square shaped piece of glass on the suitcase. Special note, John Ramsey testified that the window was slightly open and he pushed it closed and latched it. However, you can see in this video recording that the window is wide open. So it had to have been opened at that moment when they came down there looking around for something suspicious. Otherwise, John Ramsey isn't telling the truth about the window. And then John went to the boiler room, and then he opened up the wine cellar door and screamed, Oh my God, oh my God. And then Fleet came in, touched John Bonet's cold ankle, and then he ran out upstairs and yelled, for someone to call an ambulance. John Bonet was lying on her back with the white blanket wrapped around her. Her hands were stretched over her head, tightly bound with thin nylon cord. A piece of black duct tape covered her mouth. Next to her body was one of her favorite pink nightgowns. Well, 
This ends this episode of Unsolved, and I hope you enjoyed it. And the next episode on the Ramsey case will involve some of the gatherings that took place before, shortly before Christmas, to look for maybe a possible suspect, and maybe looking at the ransom note a little bit more with who might have wrote it if it wasn't Patsy, John, or Burke. <laughs>